people here locally. Uh, we got uh, people from Canada, basically every state in the union. Uh, so we've got a, got a lot of folks uh, here today. So we just get this recording going. Welcome, folks, to uh, Portrait Retouching for the Artistically Challenged with Lee Bears. We are just delighted to have Lee with us. Uh, again, my name is Brenda Hipsher. I'm a field marketing manager with x Right Photo. Lee and I met some years ago at uh, the Palm Springs Photo Festival, and we have been anxious to have Lee with us ever since for a webinar, so we are just so happy to have him here with us today. He's the owner and founder of uh, Veris Photo Media, which you can find uh, on the net at, uh, uh, I believe it's Veris.com. Lee is a photo illustrator working in Hollywood. He's been involved in commercial photography for the last 35 years and started working with computer imaging over 20 years ago, which is an eternity uh, in the computer imaging uh, industry. Um, his work has been featured on uh, all kinds of uh, everything from movie posters to CD covers, brochures, uh, catalogs, magazine articles, you name it. Um, he's been featured in National Geographic and Fortune magazines, uh, too many magazines for me, that Range Finder, Photo District News, Mac Art and Design, you name it, he's been on it. He has books out, um, his latest book is called Mastering Exposure in the Zone System for Digital Photographers. And then for those of you who are attending this webinar today, his book, Digital Photography uh, for Creative Professionals, and his other book, Skin, The Complete Guide to Digital, uh, to Digitally Lighting, Photographing, and Retouching Faces and Bodies will also be interesting to, to you. Um, he's just a great guy. He knows all kinds of stuff. Uh, he has a firm command of both uh, traditional and digital techniques, and that gives him a clear advantage uh, in this world. Um, we are just so happy to have him. I'm going to stop talking, let him get started. Uh, Lee, I'm going to shift over the uh, presenter to you, and uh, we just so much appreciate you being with us today. Okay. So am I am I on? Just one more moment. There we go. All righty. That should be you. Take it away. Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, I like to call this retouching for the artistically challenged. Uh, not to suggest that none of you are t are particularly artistically challenged, uh, but uh, really to say that you don't actually need to be a master illustrator to do great retouching if you leverage the power of Photoshop. And we're going to be showing some interesting techniques. Uh, I'm not even using a Wacom tablet today. So, so Lee, uh, I, yeah. I'm not, are, are you showing your screen now? I am. Can you see it? I don't. So uh, let's get some feedback from folks. Oh, uh, I see. Hang on. I've got to click. I didn't see this before. It must have been under a window. So All here right. we go. <laughs> I have clicked that. There we go. Now you can see it, right? Fantastic. Okay, Excuse retouching me for, for the artistically you. challenged. That's there fine. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to dive right into Photoshop, but before I do that, I uh, just thought I'd give you a real quick little overview of uh, who I am and what I've been doing. And uh, actually, I, I count my years of being in photography as about 40 years, and 20 years of that has been in digital imaging. So I, I like to think of myself as having one foot in, uh, you know, both the old school film days and uh, in t fully immersed into digital. Um, most of my career has been involved in doing movie posters. Uh, and for instance, I shot the moth on the Silence of the Lambs movie poster. So I've been doing this for a while. Um, I got into digital very early and I was one of the first uh, photographers to be shooting digitally for movie posters. This was a billboard and uh, was shot digitally and um, my niche is body double. So the head here is is kind of digitally stripped onto the body, the body of somebody else. Uh, however, we ended up having to use Angelina Jolie's boobs for this image because we just couldn't find a better <laughs> a better set for the for the picture. Um, I was also the unofficial photographer of the Enterprise for for most of the Star Trek movies um, except the latest ones. 
I was the photographer that shot the picture used of the ship. And it's almost always used really small, but like, for instance, in this particular poster, that, that uh, ship was a fantastic model that was built at Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, it was about 10 feet long, and the saucer section was about 6 feet in diameter. And every little window in this model had a 35 millimeter slide that was backlit, and it, you, you could walk up to it and look into a room interior shot. So it was, it was just like this crazy detailed model, and it was only in the movie for about 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I also did uh, an image very uh, quite a while ago, I believe uh, 1991. Um, this was uh, an elaborate composite done for National Geographic, and uh, of course all the, it's just one chimp that's uh, composited many times, and they're all working on simian versions of, of Shakespeare here. Uh, a couple other uh, images that I've I've done, and uh, okay, we're going to dive right into it. I'm going to get into Photoshop, and we're going to talk about um, portrait retouching. Okay, so um, first, let's take a look at this image, and as we can see by this uh, profile mismatch dialog. Uh, this particular image, I'm opening it up, it was, uh, it's a camera JPEG, and uh, the camera setting had it at Adobe RGB, and I, I standardize my workspace as sRGB. And uh, I, I'll just say that the S in sRGB does not stand for stupid or shitty. Okay, it just means standard, and if you can make an image look great in sRGB, it looks good everywhere. So. Uh, and that's about all I'll say about that. However, uh, and you know, if you if you have a well calibrated monitor, if you've been using, say, the X uh, uh monitor, uh, i1 Pro uh, monitor calibrator, um, you'll be able to see that this image is is a little saturated, um, and there's a number of reasons for that. The first being that it's a camera JPEG that has been assigned in the camera when you pick uh, Adobe RGB as your kind of color space. It does nothing to the way the camera captures the colors. It just sort of defines the colors that the camera captures as Adobe RGB. And this is a very common uh, occurrence where the skin tones look too red. They're sort of super saturated. Um, and I, I'm going to talk about a technique here to uh, fix this. Uh, first, first thing though, let's, let's actually reassign a profile here. So I'm, instead of converting, I'm going to go to assign profile and just see, play a what if game to see if this looks better in sRGB. Okay, and so depending on how your monitor is calibrated, you probably will be able to see that uh, if I reassign the profile associated with this file to sRGB, it looks a whole lot better. It's not quite so ridiculously oversaturated, but we still have some problems with red blotchy skin, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. So just this one move has helped me, and I have a better starting place. Okay, so and the, the other thing that I'm going to talk about is the info panel here. We're going to look at the numbers. Um, and the reason I like to look at the numbers, I'm going to show you one other little image here. Let's see if I can find it. This, oh, oop. There it is. Uh, and we'll use the embedded profile here as well. Okay, so the reason I like to uh, double check things with the numbers is, is, is this. It, the longer we look at this, uh, we're pretty convinced when we look at this that we're looking at a gray square with a white and a black, you know, successively smaller squares. And uh, I think, you know, just by looking, the assumption is that this is is neutral. But in fact, it's not neutral. I want you to kind of turn away or close your eyes, and I'm going to make a change. Okay, and now turn back and see if you can see. Do did you notice anything change? 
if your monitor is really calibrated well, maybe, but now you'll be able to see. If I toggle this on and off, you can see really easily that the top layer, which we were first looking at, is a little cool. And if I run my cursor around in the image, we can see the RGB numbers up here do not lie. And in fact, this has a blue bias. You know, our red is 123, the green is 127, and the blue is 129. Uh, so, just by looking, it's hard to tell. And the longer you stare at this, the more neutral this gray looks. And really, this is the whole reason we need to calibrate our monitors, because our eyes are not good calibrators. So you can't just adjust your monitor visually and expect to be accurate. Um, and as we can see here, the numbers tell us that you know our, our gray is not neutral, and in fact, we don't even have a pure white here. You know, our red's 245, the green's 244, and the blue's 250. So yeah, the white's not, you know, if this was white, it would be 255 all the way across. And guess what? It's not really black either. Okay, so as it turns out, the human visual system's really bad at this kind of precision. And you need to be calibrating your monitor. And uh, really, for my money, the best monitor calibrator is the i1 uh, Pro monitor calibrator. Um, you need to be calibrating your monitor so that the monitor can actually train your eye. You, you need to have that monitor in a, in a zero state, a neutral state, and over time your, your actual perception of colors on screen will improve as long as you're keeping your monitor in a consistent state. So that means these days usually recalibrating every month. Okay, and that's that's my rant for the monitor calibration. <laughs> I'm going to stop now. I think I've proved my point. And uh, we're going to look at this, and we can see that this is just too red. It's a very common problem. I'm going to show you a really quick and easy solution for this. Uh, and I'm going to give you the secret formula for uh, for good skin tone. Okay, so actually, kind of on the side of the face here, if I, if I just move my cursor over there, uh, I can look over at the CMYK numbers in our info panel. We have RGB is the actual numbers of the file, and the secondary color readout is CMYK. Um, so even it's, though it's RGB, I can look at CMYK color readouts, and I see here uh, cyan is 15%, magenta is 42, and yellow is 50 and that's actually a good ratio for skin tones. The, the magenta and yellow are closer to each other than either one of those is to cyan. And yellow's a little bit higher, usually with Caucasian skin about 10% higher. Uh, and it's really the ratio. The actual value is not important because skin can be lighter or darker. Uh, and it's much easier to tell how red or yellow the skin is if you're looking at the CMYK numbers. Now, of course, if we move over to you know a red portion, like on the tip of his nose here, it's kind of reversed. We see it's very saturated. The, the cyan value is really low, and magenta is higher. It's much higher than yellow. So uh, this, this gentleman here is an acupuncturist, uh, Dr. Doug, and we'd like him to look really healthy instead of looking like uh, he's feeling no pain. So I'm going to show you a really quick uh, and easy uh, way of uh, correcting for this without needing to actually get in there and clone stamp or paint over the areas. Uh, this is a really powerful technique and it, it takes advantage of the hue saturation adjustment. So I'm going to create a new hue saturation adjustment layer and instead of just adjusting the saturation of the master here, this is a, it's a drop down menu that lets us select color ranges. So we're going to select reds because we want to adjust out the red color of the skin. And as soon as I select this here, I've got a series of eyedroppers here. And the, the, the leftmost eyedropper here is our primary selection. And we're going to find the most egregiously red color. And I can kind of wiggle this around and look at the numbers in the upper right corner until I find some something that really has that, that you know, magenta value much, much higher, right? So something like that. I click on it and notice how this area here just shifted over just ever so slightly to center over that red color. Okay, so it's centered over the red color. Now we're going to use the minus eyedropper to subtract the good color skin. 
Okay, so you can see this little area trimmed in, it got smaller. And uh, we can trim off a little bit from the from the yellow side uh, a little more using this this other little outside slider. So the dark the dark region in here, let me move in here so you can see. This dark region is the fully selected color and the gray regions on either side are how that ramps off into the surrounding colors. Okay, so now to fully visualize the colors that are targeted for my uh, hue adjustment, I'm going to do something really ridiculous. I'm going to slide the slider all the way over to the left. And we can see now in this image that uh, the nose area, which is the most red, is, is now shifted to cyan. So we can kind of see that those are the areas that are fully targeted. And what I want to do is, is maybe trim off a, a bit so that the good color skin is not affected at all. And so now you can see only the, the most red skin is targeted and is being shifted. And we'll come back to zero here. And I'm just going to start moving it. Let's zoom in just a little bit so you can see what's happening. You can see the kind of patchy redness on his skin. I'm going to move this to the right in the direction that I want this red color to move. I want it to move to be more yellow and less magenta. So I have to move it to the right. Up here, uh, you kind of have to ignore this gradient because I'm not moving it towards blue. I'm actually going to move the slider to the right so it'll get more yellow. Okay, so we move to the right and look at the image. Just move it over a little bit and then I, when I get to about there, I've, I've shifted the red out. I'll, I'll toggle this on and off. That's before, that's after, and I've, I've really shifted the red out. So it's really that easy, and I haven't had to paint anything in. Uh, however, you do have to pay attention here uh, to the lips, especially if this is a woman and we needed to shift that red out. Uh, you would also shift out the, the lipstick. Now, we could kind of get away with it here with a, with a photo of a man, uh, but we, we can mask off the effect by painting with black into the layer mask associated with this hue saturation adjustment. And I'll, I'll set my opacity a little lower. And uh, I'm just going to kind of paint over the, the lips. I'm painting in the layer mask with black, removing a little bit of that adjustment. So I brought back a little bit of the redness of the lips. But you can see how that really effectively removes that uh, red blotchy skin and equalizes the, the uh, color of his skin. Uh, this is also great for group shots where you ha might have one person who's a little pink, maybe another person's a little yellow. You can use this technique to kind of bring everybody's skin tone into the same range. Uh, so very, very powerful technique. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on here. Uh, we're going to come to this one later. This is an interesting interesting problem. I think what I'm going to try to do now is do a little bit more of a, of a kind of complete retouch on uh, using this particular image here. So here we have, uh, this is an image shot in one of my glamour workshops and it's, it's kind of a low key, uh, you know, it's the darker tones and it's meant to sort of simulate a little bit of the George Rail type of lighting. It's very contrasty. Uh, lighting with a beauty dish and uh, usually first thing I do with this type of thing is and I'm going to kind of zoom right in and the first thing I, I usually do is just take out the, the, the spots you know little things that I just want to go away and for that we use the spot uh, spot healing brush here okay and I will make an empty layer to contain the retouching. Uh, and this may only be temporary, uh, but I like to keep the, the, the retouching off the original just in case I need to go back. It makes it easier, right? So uh, the spot healing brush, really the, uh, the default behavior is content aware, and we can just kind of use it to click on little defects that we want to remove. And you know, like if you have a larger area that you want to cover up, you can kind of just sort of paint over it, and um, it it takes the texture or the the tones from the surrounding area and uh, blends it in. Now, sometimes 
when you work with this, uh, it either gets too smooth or it starts to it starts to grab too much texture or or the shapes and things from the surrounding area. And if it's if it's kind of behaving that way, or you get an area that's too smooth, you can try changing to create texture here. Now this is it works a little bit differently. It takes the 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 color from the surrounding area, color and tone from the surrounding area to cover up the the spot, but it it adds a little more texture and it's a little more random texture. Um, so sometimes that works better to kind of cover up things. And if you get unusually, you know, it's if it's unusually textured or there's un, you don't like the texture, try it again. Uh, my rule of thumb here is to try it like three times, and if it, if it doesn't work after three times, I'll try something else. I'll use the you know, the the traditional clone stamp tool or something. But I I can go around here and just take out all the all the kind of little spots that I want to go away. And I I'm not going to get too crazy in here. I could a lot of real professional retouching is literally pour by pour like this. Um, but I'm just going to go around and take out the biggest things, things that uh, I just want to go away. This is usually really great for taking out little stray hairs. I can just paint right over hairs like this. And I, you know, I'm not going to force you to look at all, all of this. But I, this is, you know, this is what I would do. I just take out every little spot that uh, I just never want to see again. And you know she's got little kind of sparkles coming off her her dress here. I would take all of those out. I'm not going to force you to watch me do that, because um, I'm going to show you another technique uh, that is uh, more powerful for skin smoothing. Okay, so I'm going to flatten this now. Uh, let's just assume that I'm done with my little spotting. So I'll flatten the image, and I'm going to show you the uh, technique invented by uh, Calvin Hollywood, who's a German photographer. <laughs> it's, his name actually is Calvin Hollywood. Um, and uh, it works like this. This is a sort of non-intuitive, so kind of pay attention here. There's a weird sequence of steps. I'm going to duplicate the background. Okay, and then I'm going to invert it. Command or Control I or Image Adjustments Invert. Okay. So now everything that was dark is light, and the colors are inverted, and, uh, and then I'm going to change the layer blending option to vivid light. Okay, and I've completely smoothed out the skin here. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, we're not done. Uh, the, there's a, we're going to run a couple of filters. Now, anytime I'm going to run filters, I, I think immediately... Uh, smart object. I'm going to convert this layer into a smart object so that I can uh, have uh, more options when I run these filters. So um, I go to layer, uh, smart objects, convert to smart object. Okay, so now that's a smart object. You can see this little kind of badge there on the, on the layer thumbnail. And now when I run filters, they will be smart filters and, and that has certain advantages uh, uh, so you can revise the filters after you've applied them. So we're going to run two different filters. The first filter is filter other high pass. And we normally think of using high pass in a sharpening effect, but because this layer is inverted, uh, when we run the filter, we get a kind of softening, a smoothing effect. And, and the key here is to, is to use a, select a radius that High, high enough radius to get smoothing without getting highlight inversion. So you see, if I, if I choose too high a radius, the highlight kind of inverts and gets dark. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is try and find a radius where all my highlights are clean, so, but as, as high a, a, a blur or a, a highest radius as I can to get as much smoothing as I can. Now over here, I've got a little bit of inversion, but I'm just not going to, I just won't paint into that area. I'm liking the smoothness I'm getting now in just the areas of the skin. I'm ignoring everything else. So I say, okay, and you'll see this is a, a smart filter, so it sort of stacks underneath the smart object. And we're going to run another filter now. Again, I told you this was not very intuitive, 
because uh, we're going to use a blur filter and we'll use Gaussian blur to bring back the micro texture of the skin. So usually what I aim for is uh, either one-third of the radius that I use for uh, the smoothing or one one quarter. So if I use a smaller radius, I get uh, a little bit smoother skin. So it all depends on, you know, just exactly the effect that you're going for. If we go really low, then the skin starts smoothing out uh, to the point where it starts looking a little plastic. So uh, I think I think I'm going to go halfway between. We'll say, you know, 3.5 pixels here. Okay, now we're, we're still not done, but you can kind of see how much smoothing is being applied. Now we're going to add a black layer mask to hide this effect. And the shortcut to doing that is to hold down Option or Alt and click on your layer mask icon. And now we've hidden the skin smoothing. And uh, what we'll do next is simply brush back in with a white, um, with a white brush full opacity here. Uh, and we're brushing into the layer mask that's hiding the skin smoothing. And so I just go in there and it's like, it's like working an iron. You know, we just get in there and you know, smooth out the skin. It, and it really shouldn't look like we're doing too much. Okay. We just run this over the areas. And I'm not going to run it over that highlight because I know it's a little inverted over there, so I'll leave that alone. Uh, but you can see that it's it's doing a good job of just kind of smoothing out. I'm And again, I'm, I'm just using a mouse here. I'm not using a Wacom tablet. Um, it's particularly good in, in this application with the darker skin, uh, especially the darker African-American skin can get this kind of ashy look and they often complain about that in the pictures and this just really eliminates that completely. So it's a really good technique for that. And uh, you know, I can run this over all the areas of the skin that I want to smooth out. And in most cases it doesn't damage really the, the actual texture of the skin. It just kind of gives you a, a nice sort of smoothing effect but preserves the, the real texture of the skin. Right, so I'll just cover up everything that I want to smooth out. Now there's whenever you do something like this where you're painting with a layer mask it's always a good idea to solo the mask so uh, just to see it in isolation. And we do that by holding on the Option or Alt key. And I click on that and I can see, oh, there's some holes. So uh, this is just a good way to make sure that you, you know, are not missing areas that you wanted to cover. And so if I Option click or Alt click on it again, it would be Alt on the PC, Option on the Mac. I can see and sort of toggle back and forth and see the areas that you know, I might have missed and make sure that I'm covering up everything that I want to cover up. Like say if there's a lot of holes in here and I can easily identify those by looking at the mask in isolation. And then just sort of toggle back and forth to make sure that I'm kind of getting into all the areas that I really need to. Okay. All right, so let's let's zoom out, take a look at this. Uh, that's our after. This is the before. You know, and it's she still has her actual skin texture in there, but this this smoothing is really giving it a nice glamorizing effect. And if it was not a glamour portrait, if it was a you know more kind of normal portrait, I might like to reduce the opacity just a little bit here, you know, to, to bring back a, a little bit of the uh, reality, you know, but even that much does, goes a long way to, to glamorizing the image. And for this type of image, I would go ahead and use it full strength. It's, we're trying to really oversell the, the beauty and glamour here. So now it looks a little bit more like a, a Remy Martin ad. Okay. Now I wanted to, uh, uh, I had a, a request, a gentleman sent me uh, an image here, um, and uh, Doug here sent me this image, 
and I'm going to, you know, I, I'm pretty sure this is a really well photographed image, so I'm pretty sure he fully intends this to be an Adobe RGB. It was probably shot raw, and he processed it out to Adobe RGB. So even though it has that red look, and we're going to first uh, correct for the red skin, I'll leave it in Adobe RGB, um, and we'll do our, we'll do our real quickly, this kind of acts as a review. Uh, I'm going to do the, the shifting of the reds, Okay, we'll target the most red area right there, and um, there's most of his skin is is a little on the red side, so I'm not going to trim it off a bit. I'm just going to kind of shift it a little bit. You know, maybe maybe we can shift it off this side just a little bit, but I'm I'm just going to go ahead and kind of shifted enough so that we kind of take the red curse off of it. It's still, uh, there's still areas that are a little red. But this, the, the areas that are now starting to get a little yellow, maybe, I will, uh, I'll trim that in. And so now we have a much nicer looking skin tone. Okay. Uh, now, Doug's main complaint here was oily skin and shine. So um, he's he's concerned about these white highlights. Like, how do we get rid of this? And uh, you know, doesn't want to use a clone stamp tool. I mean, it can just be a nightmare to try to take care of this. So I'm going to show you a really powerful technique uh, that's similar. Excuse me, similar to the technique we just saw about skin smoothing, but we're going to do something called uh, frequency separation retouching, which works great for this particular image. So in order to do that, uh, and I, I'm, again, I'm kind of, just to make it simpler, I'm just going to go ahead and apply this adjustment. So I'll flatten the image, and I'll make two extra copies. Okay, so uh, one of these is going to be our texture, and one is going to be um, a blur. Okay, so we'll let's just we'll not look at the texture layer just yet. We're just going to blur this. I'm going to go ahead and filter it with with Gaussian blur. And my goal here is to find a radius that eliminates the texture. You know, pretty much I don't want to see any texture left in the skin. And we're going to have to go pretty high with this gentleman because his, his skin is very rough. And I, probably about here is pretty good. Okay, so we've, we've, we've got a, enough of a blur that I've eliminated the texture. And then we're going to go to our texture layer. So I target the texture layer, turn it on. And now we're going to do a, a very interesting calculation that's actually been available in Photoshop for a long time. Uh, we're going to go image, apply image. And what we're going to do is subtract the blur from this sharp version. So I'm going to get my apply image dialog up. And what I, what I want to do is not go to the merged but to the blur because I'm targeting the sharp image. And I want to subtract the soft image from the sharp image. And and these two fields are very important. We want to set the scale to 2 and the offset to 128. Um, you know, the offset may be 1 or it may be 0 uh, when you first come in here, but change the offset value to 128. That gives us a, a medium gray base for the overall. And then the scale uh, increases the, the intensity of the, the sharpness just a bit so that uh, the next step will work out. So we'll say, OK, now. And we've got this layer on top of the blur layer, but if we change the apply mode from normal to linear light, it comes back. It looks exactly, these two layers together, the, the texture and the blur, are exactly identical to the original, right? So the advantage of this, now especially in this application, uh, I'm going to eliminate the shine, but preserve the texture. So I'll make an empty layer in between these two, and 
that's going to sort of contain the color that I'm going to blow in here to help cover up this highlight. So I'm going to get a nice big soft brush and I'm going to select uh, a lighter skin color here. Okay, so I put that in the foreground. Now I'm going to paint into this layer and this layer is covering up if we, if we just look at the blur layer by itself. The highlight is there in the blur layer, right? So we're going to cover up that highlight with, with paint uh, and it's going to hide uh, this sheen a bit. Uh, usually also I'll, I'll use a slightly lower opacity so that I'm not uh, building it up too fast and I'll just kind of paint into this highlight. Usually select an area next to it and just sort of paint in. Uh, select the area next to the highlight which would be the sort of normal color and kind of just paint it over that area and you the more you cover that the shine the duller it will look so you know kind of usually want to be a little judicious about how you do this we're not trying to retouch this guy at this point but uh, I can I can kind of blow in some color um, that will hide the shine. And because the texture is uh, separate from the actual color, we can, we can really eliminate the look of the oily skin without damaging the texture of the skin. Okay, now dealing with the texture, if I, if I want to mitigate some of the texture, I can actually retouch on the texture. And sometimes it's better to do that not in place, but we'll, you know, put it back to normal and <clears throat> come in here and look. Uh, my same, you know, spot healing tool works here in the texture. I'll just, you know, find, maybe see now that that's creating a texture. It's grabbing the texture from the whiskers. Uh, so let's let's try content aware here. Okay, so I can I can retouch this way directly on this texture layer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or another thing that I like to do in this final technique that I'm going to show you is um, we're going to actually group a layer here uh, with the texture layer, an empty layer, and I'm going to force it to be in a clipping group. So I, I hold down the option or Alt key and click in between the two layers. So now this is targeting that and we'll change this into uh, a, a, either a soft light or an overlay layer. We'll, we'll try soft light here. And now I can use this to dodge and burn over the texture. So anything, any texture that is like too, too dark, if I paint into that using a paintbrush with a uh, you know, and we'll, we'll uh, use a very low opacity or, you know, sometimes uh, even lower, I'll, I'll like to use like, like 5%. And I can just get in there and just, you know, I'm not trying to hide the texture, but I'm sort of knocking it back. So I'm just kind of working those pores that are just, you know, maybe a little too uh, bright or too evident. And I'm just sort of filling it in just a little. You know, I can do this in the wrinkles too. I mean, we really wouldn't do this. This guy has a great face, right? But, you know, maybe we would just take out, a f you know, knock them back a little bit. So I'm just, you know, you can see how if I brush over it in low opacity enough times, I can kind of knock it back without actually damaging the texture. You know, just make it a little less deep. And you can do a lot of retouching this way. Uh, and in this case, less is more. I, I, I wouldn't really want to take all the character out of his face, but you can see how that works. So in essence, that's the, that's the frequency separation approach. 
and we'll change this now back to uh, linear light. And so that's where we are now. Um, I think pretty effectively removing not maybe not all of the shine, but just knocking it back. And here was our original after the the skin hue adjustment. And you can see how that's really knocked the shine back without really damaging the texture of the skin. Okay, so that that's all basically the the techniques I that we have time for uh, here, and uh, uh, I'm let's go back. I just wanted to end by uh, uh, talking a little bit about uh, other resources that you can use. I'm uh, I hope you've enjoyed these powerful techniques. Um, you can find more advanced information on my website and my blog which is available for free. I also have a YouTube channel with lots of video tutorials that you can see for free. And you can follow me on Twitter to find out my, about my various classes and workshops that I uh, conduct all over the country. Uh, I have two books in print, as was mentioned before. Uh, these are available on Amazon in Kindle as well as paper versions. Uh, Mastering Exposure in the Zone System for Digital Photographers. And my bestseller, Skin, the Complete Guide to digitally lighting, photographing, and retouching faces and bodies. I also have a comprehensive course on photo illustration, uh, masking and in image compositing and such. Um, that's online at, at udemy.com. That's nine hours of step-by-step -step video tutorials with all the work files you need to, uh, to work along with me uh, available for download. And uh, today I am going to give you a special discount you can purchase at 50% off. It's normally $99, and I'm going to give you that. It's YouTube50. So you type that in uh, as a coupon code just like that, and you get 50% off. You'll get it for $49. And um, I'm also teaching an online course at the Picture Perfect School of Photography called Photoshop Layers Fundamentals. It's now open for enrollment. This is a four-week course with assignments and critiques where I teach about Photoshop selections, masks, adjustments, and layers. And I also have a DVD at Photoshop Cafe with five hours of instruction about photo illustration techniques. And right now it's discounted, uh, but I don't know for how long, so grab your copy today. That's at Photoshop Cafe. And finally, be sure and like my Veris Photo Media page on Facebook. If you sign up for my email list, I'll send you a free PDF tutorial on the Zone system. And that's it for my presentation. I think hopefully I have a little bit of time for questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, did, uh, I, did I please, work it out or not? Uh, Are we? No, you did it just absolutely great. And we got people just raving, raving, raving on here about how much they have enjoyed what you've done today. You had a lot of questions about is there a book with step-by-step -step techniques and so you answered that. Does he have more <laughs> stuff? Yes, he has more stuff. So uh, all you folks who are asking, uh, and there was there were a lot of you who were asking is there a book? Is there somewhere to learn more? Is there Are there videos? So uh, you just answered a, a whole lot of those questions. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, yeah, people are just nuts. So I've got several questions here that uh, okay. they didn't answer. Uh, and uh, so let's go through those just a little bit. Uh, sure. First of all, what what version of Photoshop were you using and is there anything that you showed us today that is not contained in Photoshop uh, 6, for instance? Um, there is absolutely nothing I showed you today that is not available in, in CS6. Uh, in fact, most of this stuff uh, is available going back several versions. I thought um, everything I saw was actually available in five. So that, that oh that yeah, was... yeah. The spot healing tool uh, I believe came in in uh, CS four. Uh huh. So um, and that's really you know uh, the probably the the, the latest feature <laughs> uh, used here. So there's no there's all of these tricks. A lot of these tricks uh, are available in in pre CS. Uh, versions of Photoshop. So, um, you know, the, the, the ply image here, you know, this has been in Photoshop since like day one. Uh, so, uh, some of these techniques, you know, will work in almost any version of Photoshop. And really, uh, Photoshop's an amazing program, and there are some cool things with the latest version. I'm using uh, uh, CC here. Uh, and I think, especially now that they've announced, uh, you know, the special photography bundle at, at ten bucks a month, 
you know you can't you know you can't go wrong so um, you know just upgrade you know but uh, if you're if you're stuck on a on a version or you know it runs great on your computer and you're you're anxious about upgrading just about everything I showed you here will still work on on your version of Photoshop okay now the there was a the, you have a custom toolbar there and we had a couple of questions about that custom toolbar oh, and how do you create oh, this, that and, the, yeah, these yeah. this here I just have a couple of custom extensions uh, these are all you know that's the history these are actions this is the you know the color palette uh, I I like to rearrange my uh, you know my the layout of my interface um, you know and you can kind of do that all up here in fact let, let's you know let's see let's let's change the workspace uh, back to the essentials and uh, I'll reset the reset essentials so this is what you know the standard interface looks like and you know you notice that this bar is not really populated with anything and uh, the toolbar always defaults to the left side now unless you're left-handed I see no reason why you need to keep this over here and in fact if you were left-handed I'd move everything else over to the left side so I'm right-handed I like to move the toolbar over there like that so and then as far as getting stuff in here you just you know just look through um, the window menu and select the items that you want to use and you just put them in there um, you know so we've got uh, layer comps and you know I, I can go through and just add all all the different types of things into this iconized tool panel and then if you need them they're they're here you know you can you can just click on it uh, and when you're ready to save it you go down here and just save the workspace I've already saved mine so I'll just pop it back there. It just shows, uh, you know, all the things that you, you've learned to speed your, speed yourself up here doing this work. It's just great that you're sharing all this. Um, I've got a couple of questions here that are related to each other. So let me go to those. The first question is, um, uh, are both techniques you showed mutually exclusive, like the gauze and blur to soften skin and then the frequency separation for highlights? Um, could you use both of those together? And then a related question is, is can you make too many layers? Can you make too many layers? Well, I don't think Photoshop technically has a, a limit on layers. I mean, you can make too many layers by just being sloppy. Uh, <laughs> so, But it doesn't like... You know. uh, Overload things. I mean, you could you uh, could come up with a situation where you're yeah, doing one thing I mean, on you know, one layer and undoing it on another, but right, that yeah, doesn't I mean, really matter. That's that's really just kind of being careful in your workflow options. You do, yeah, you don't want to undo something that you've done on another layer underneath it. So there's no point to it. Just don't do that in the first place. Uh, and I see that a lot with adjustment layers. People will add adjustments and then they'll add another adjustment that undoes the adjustment they did before. And you know, that's that's stuff. And you know, if you get huge amounts of layers then the file size gets really big and it can get sluggish you know performance wise um, so I mean those are all kind of you know fairly straightforward considerations um, uh, so now the other question involved the mutual exclusivity of the two techniques I, I showed two separate techniques right one was the skin smoothing you know the Calvin Hollywood skin smoothing that put it all into one layer um, and then there's this this frequency separation which separates the texture from the the smooth layer so there those are two separate techniques uh, would you ever you, use them together well there's no real need to use them together I mean uh, we can uh, we can just modify how we do the the frequency separation to get an effect very similar to uh, the other Calvin Hollywood one uh, the uh, the Calvin Hollywood skin smoothing is easier to do. You can write an action that gets it kind of put in place a lot quicker, and it's only one layer that you really have to deal with and mask. So it's it's, but it's a little more appropriate for um, for the kind of glamour type of you know idealizing of the skin. Uh, frequency separation is more flexible. You can do both. It's it's a little more complicated, uh, and you can end up with many more layers. You can see right here that you know all of these layers I have to 
the 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 frequency separation right now I've got one two three four layers that all together are creating the the the, the you know the skin retouching effect and I you know I can put them in a group right so that I can use a layer mask on that group but um, that's a lot more layers than than the skin smoothing thing which just really has that one layer uh, so they're not I mean you could I guess combine the two but there's really no reason because frequency separation is capable of doing the same types of smoothing not not the way I showed it here but it, it, you can you know just by uh, how you work the texture you instead of using such a high blur radius to begin with and subtracting that if you use a, a lower radius you're going to get a finer texture in the skin when you finally subtract it uh, it's just not particularly appropriate in this particular uh, example. Now on YouTube I have uh, a video called uh, Ultimate Skin Retouching Technique and that is, it goes over a frequency separation in a more glamour context and I show a way of, of getting that, a similar kind of skin smoothing effect with that. So you can check that out on YouTube. Uh, so here's a question that I don't even understand so I'm this is how far away I am from this stuff. Uh, what are the recommended CMYK ratios for different ethnic skin types? Do you subscribe okay, to that's, that kind of that's, thought process? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I'm happy I mean, this, that I could transmit it because I have no yeah. idea what it means. <laughs> yeah, so in this, in this example, I didn't quite go all the way with, uh, you know, adjusting the skin color. He's, he's still a little bit on the magenta side. It's, it, it's a lot better you know, than the original, right, which is really, really magenta. Um, so the, the skin ratios that I gave before uh, where magenta and yellow are, let's just, I'm, I'm going to just kind of redo this. You know, we'll do the skin shifting here and, um, you know, shifting reds and I'm just going to go ahead and shift it towards yellow. Okay, so right now in this area, uh, it, the the CMYK numbers, yellow is just a little bit higher than magenta. Uh, usually, when yellow equals magenta, that's still too pink. It looks a little sunburned. Um, so uh, now, as far as different ethnicities, it's surprising how well this works across ethnic groups. There are some uh, considerations if you're dealing with a you know Hispanic skin you can allow more yellow to show up. Uh, Chinese also, you know, maybe a little more yellow. Um, with the darker the skin gets, with the really, really dark African American skin, you, you do the opposite. You allow more magenta uh, because you use the magenta to offset the possibility of a green cast because as the skin gets darker, the cyan value will get darker you'll get a higher percentage in there to make the skin darker. And the cyan plus yellow makes green. So that, you know, with a dark, dark skin, you really have to guard against uh, having skin color that's too green. It has a green cast. So with really dark African-American skin, I allow the magenta to equal the yellow. And that pretty much eliminates the, the possibility of a green cast. Um, so that's the one area where it sort of, it, you, you, have an exception for the ratio between yellow and magenta. Um, so yeah, uh, pretty, pretty much even though skin color is all over the place, real skin color, our goal usually in portraiture is not to make it look accurate necessarily, you know, because quite frankly, you know, this, this is accurate. That's probably what he looks like. Uh, but, you know, in reproduction, we all have a, a different idea what good color is, and it's it's more like that, you know. We uh, so so we usually try to cheat the skin color towards kind of a, a reproductive ideal, and then this also is cultural, you know. Some in some cultures, the, the you know they they prefer the skin tone to look different. In, in Asian cultures, they usually uh, go for a much more uh, subdued color, paler. Uh, you know, this color of this gentleman's face would be considered uh, uh, the color of a corpse in China. They they like their skin to be really pale, and the, anything this dark is considered you know bad. Um, so you you do have to take cultural considerations into uh, cons you know 
into consideration. That's always a, it's always important when we're doing any kind of retouching. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, so but I'll ask you and, and you can teach me. If we merge or flatten layers, everything we've done in those layers then becomes part of the image file, right? It becomes the part of the background layer. Yeah. 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 So it doesn't it doesn't negate anything we've done when we merge or flatten them, right? We no, I mean, adjust them any further. you just can't adjust them any further. And, you know, I will only do that with something that I, I know I'm not going to need to readjust. So, you know, like the spotting, the little spotting stuff. I mean, it, it's kind of obvious um, that I don't ever want to see those spots again. And as long as I'm satisfied that I've done a decent deep retouch, I can flatten at that point and then move right. on. But um, I generally preserve as many layers as possible for my work in progress document. And I will I will flatten and save as to make a final flat version that I'm going to deliver to the client or send to uh, you know service bureau for, for printing or something like that. Uh, so generally, I don't give my layers out to people. Right. Because as soon as you do that, somebody will muck with it and mess it up. And, you know, you're, you're, then you then they'll come back to you. And go, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, you know. we have several questions here asking, is most of what you covered today in your books, in your book skin? Um, actually, the, the frequency separation and skin smoothing are newer techniques. The skin book is getting a little old. I think it's about uh, four or five years old now, the, the, the last edition. Um, so the, you know, these those two techniques. Uh, everything else, you know, the color of the skin, the hue saturation stuff, uh, and a lot of other stuff uh, is still valid, and, and it's in the book. But those last two techniques are not in the book. Uh, but you can find those on my YouTube channel. Uh, so that's great. And so the yeah. people who have attended this webinar are getting the very latest, and they'll it'll be in the archive. They're on your YouTube and. Uh, uh, obviously, you'll have even more things in other classes and things that you do. Now, we just, we're just we absolutely out of time, but one last question. We had a question about, uh, can you do this in, uh, in uh, Adobe Essentials? Can you do this in Lightroom? And I'm assuming that most of what you've done is our Photoshop. Yeah, you, can, you, you cannot do anything like this in Lightroom. Uh, and the... Uh, all the, the sort of calculations, the apply image stuff, and I believe m most of the blend modes that are used in the skin smoothing thing are not available in uh, uh, Photoshop Elements. I don't know, you know, Photoshop Elements, the Photoshop part of that is a little misleading because Elements is really nothing like Photoshop. Um, and the interface is completely different. But uh, it it is about 85% of Photoshop. So, it, you know, it's actually a very good bargain deal. I think it's like 60 bucks or something like that. But uh, yeah, this trick stuff that I showed today is just not available in anything but Photoshop. Well, we just, I mean, we absolutely can't thank you enough. Well, this has just been an amazing, amazing webinar. And people have just been raving about it. And uh, folks, if you loved this one, come back next month. Uh, Lee's going to do another webinar for us, a different webinar. Uh, and uh, be sure to visit his, his website and so forth and so on, uh, YouTube channel, all of that stuff. Lee, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Well, it's just been our pleasure. So, And for all of you, have a great day out there and come back and visit us at another x Right photo webinar real soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.